do is think of alternative solutions of how to put things together with different pieces that were meant for something else and make it work. It's day four in the Devon Island Mars simulation, and Robert Zubrin is beginning a one-week rotation as commander of the second crew. He comes with high hopes that this whole exercise will help us get to Mars soon. I've been interested in space exploration and the challenge of human exploration and settlement of Mars ever since I was a very small boy. I want to get a taste. I want to know to the extent that it's possible to know what it's going to feel like to be in that crew on Mars. The larger experiment that's going on here is the dynamics of a crew operating under simulation conditions. Having to obey simulation constraints places the crew under certain kind of stresses. The suit was quite, uh, I would say, bulky, but that's exactly the purpose of the simulation. So you cannot uh, do whatever movement you would like to do. You're not completely free. My name is Vladimir Pletz. I work as a physicist engineer at the Technical Center of the European Space Agency. It's located in Holland. I got involved in this simulation campaign because I truly believe that mankind's destiny would be to move out of the planet Earth and start to colonize and, and live in cities, in orbit, and on other worlds. It's a typical early morning in the habitat, and like on a real Mars mission, the crew is monitoring the weather. Okay, so here it is as a 6.45 mountain time. Rain is forecast for tonight and Friday. Brisk easterly winds can be expected... Outside, it's like a foul Martian day. Imagine dust clouds instead of drizzle. But Zubrin's crew is determined to test some equipment that could help find water on the bone-dry surface of Mars. We're going to try to deploy Vladimir's experiment, if possible, in its full glory. We need to assess what type of ground. We need to have a good contact. One of the things which is most important now in Mars research is the detection of water. Can we find water anywhere on Mars, liquid water? We know that there is some ice in the polar caps. We suspect that there might be some ice stuck into rocks just below the surface. But is it possible to find liquid water below the surface of Mars? As the crew dons their EVA suits, detailed observations are made of every step in the procedure. The hope is to get a clear idea of how long things will take and where the problems will be on a real Mars mission. In this crew, Bill Clancy, armed with a notepad, is in charge of recording all the observations. Okay, so, Morgan 15 and uh, Zubrin is getting his helmet finished. It takes almost an hour for the crew members to put on their EVA suits and get into the simulated airlock. On a real mission, astronauts will have to pass through such a chamber routinely to transition into the low-pressure atmosphere of Mars. For Vladimir, stepping out onto simulated Mars to practice looking for water strikes a chord of destiny. I think it's really written into our human gene that we are born to explore, we are born to move. It's uh, for sure the next step of mankind would be uh, Mars. The process that we're going here can allow one to imagine that they're on another planet. The scenery is certainly unearthly. The routine that we're in is extraordinary. And certainly when you're out on EVA and in the EVA suit and you're isolated from the environment. I have something in my eye that's start to bug me. You get the feel for how much work an EVA is. It underlines the fact that human exploration on Mars is going to be a physical activity. Uh, yeah, Robert, you need to go another three meters. Three. Okay. What we're doing is we're laying out a seismic array 
that can be used to sound underground for water, which is of enormous interest to future Mars explorers. Underground water is where we might be able to find life on Mars and sample it, learn its structure. Underground water would be a tremendous resource for a Mars base or a Mars settlement. This is exactly what astronauts might do on Mars. All along the cable, the crew must push special microphones, called geophones, into the hard, rocky ground. Not the best terrain to do it, but I guess the first human crew on Mars would have to face this kind of problem as well. So we better try to learn how this thing works here on, on Earth before to do it on, on Mars. On the first real mission, astronauts will have to bring along all the water they need and recycle it again and again. But if their geophones pick up a local source of underground water, the cost of future missions could go way down. Based on the crew's experience today, the seismic technology will need modification. It's tough handling things with thick gloves and hard to see displays when there are so many reflections. Put a thing on. So now we press enter. Now. Now it says measure, then it says record log. Okay, if you want. The way this works is we put these sensors out and then we send sound signals into the ground with a sledgehammer. Can you see it? And the sound goes down into the ground. And when it comes across different layers with different sound conductance, some of it penetrates, others reflects back. And so you get a series of reflections telling you about the different layers underground. Could be rock, could be granite, could be water, could be anything. We will see. We will see now with this tree at the other extremity. However. The crew re-enters the habitat through the airlock after working to the supposed limit of their oxygen supply. While the seismic data didn't reveal any water pockets, the EVA was a rich learning experience. Oh. Something I wanted to do since the beginning, scratch here. It was exhausting, frustrating, like reeling up that uh, cable that the geophones were attached to. It's getting caught on rocks. I had to, anything that you had to bend down to do. Very tiring. The main technical problem that we actually had that was a potential showstopper was the screen was not bright enough. Given the impairment and visibility due to the spacesuits and the drizzle, now on Mars there won't be drizzle but there'll be dust and your helmet can mist up still on the inside because it's cold outside and that field instruments need to have big, bright, clear displays. Big buttons, big displays. I mean, we're talking here about kindergarten type um, displays. Yeah, uh, the Arctic habitat is even giving social scientists a chance to help us get to Mars. My name is Bill Clancy. I work at NASA Ames Research Center. There I'm a computer scientist and I run a group called Work System Design and Evaluation where we're helping NASA design its operations and advanced technologies. I think the simplest way to explain what I'm trying to learn by being in this simulation is how people use the space in the hab. I could start, say, on the first day and I could notice that the table, for example, our wardroom table, was placed differently when we first came in. And someone pushed it back a little bit because it was too close for their chairs. Other people had to move it from one side because you couldn't pass on one side. So it has now reached a stable position. Now we could measure how far is that table from the wall, how much space is on each side, now you're in a position that you can say, this space fits. Well, one thing that I will try to observe systematically and document is the whole preparation for the sim. So putting on the suits and how long that takes. People start waking up between 7 and 7.30. Breakfast is complete by 9. Trinity is here. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. <laughs> we have a briefing and planning meeting. 